What is up, coordinators, naturals, and everything in between? We are back, and this week we are diving into the history of the Cosmic Era. Cosmic Era is a part of Gundam's alternate universe and the anime and manga Mobile Suit Gundam Seed. This series is huge in Japan. Some would say this reinvigorated the genre back in 2003, but Western fans seem to have a different overall opinion. Some say that many of the characters in Gundam Seed are one-dimensional, and I say that isn't fair. There are one-dimensional characters that happen to have access to nukes, and boy, do we see a lot of nukes in this series. Directed by Mitsuo Fakuda, this is Gundam's first foray into digital art. And like many Rush shows for the time, and even to this day, it was edited heavily when remastered for the home video market. But my god, look at that chin on Kira. You can stab a man's eye out with that chin. Regardless of how you feel about this, this is happening, simple humans. Push the eject button before it's too late, because we are diving into the cosmic era. Unlike Universal Century, the strife between the two warring factions are due to genetic discrimination. In Universal Century, space noids were trying to fight for their independence against the Earth noids, as people on Earth were usually richer, and the billions of people living in space were typically of lower class. In the Cosmic Era, there are two warring factions, the Naturals and the Coordinators. The plant communities, which are this universe's sides, or space colonies, which stands for People Liberation Acting Nation of Technology, began engaging in genetic engineering of humans, creating the coordinator. The naturals, or natural born humans, and the antithesis to coordinators, were becoming worried of the genetic engineering done by the spacefaring colonies and decided to step in. However, there doesn't seem to be any class disparity in the cosmic era, or at least the cause of the war was not due to classism, but rather genetic disparity. Let's start off with the Bloody Valentine Incident. The lead up to the Bloody Valentine Incident is very similar to the UC timeline. Around CE30 and all the way up to the 60s, there was a huge boom of coordinators. And with disparity comes radicalism, as the rise in coordinators brings forth Blue Cosmos, an anti-coordinator terrorist group. The Zodiac Alliance, a political organization, was formed by Atherin Zala's father, Patrick Zala, and others from the L5 colony. This essentially became the Zodiac Alliance of Freedom Treaty in CE-68, also known as ZAFT. Now with an emerging army, ZAFT and Plant was seen as a threat to the Earth Alliance, but an army wasn't enough. They needed self-sufficient agriculture. This is where the Junius colonies come into play. Junius 7, 8, 9, and 10 were set to be remodeled for agricultural production to help plant achieve this goal of self-sufficiency. With the help of their newly produced general purpose mobile suit, the Jin, it seemed that Plant and Zaft were becoming the self-sufficient nation they wanted to be. As the colonies were still a sponsored nation from Earth, they were exporting goods to Earth, but with constant attack on the colonies, mostly done by Blue Cosmos, Plant decided to cease exporting goods to Earth. After some bickering back and forth for a few months on February 11th, CE-70, the Earth Alliance declares war on Plant. During this time, the Agamemnon-class ship, the Roosevelt, leaves for Junius colonies with a particularly new nuclear-powered mobile armor. Three days after the declaration of war on February 14th, the Roosevelt met up with an ongoing attack on Plant by the Earth Alliance. During this battle, the Roosevelt launched the TSMA-2 Mobius mobile armor equipped with nuclear weapons. Zaf's Jin greatly outperformed the Mobius, but in this case, all the mobile armor had to do was survive long enough to launch the weapon of mass destruction. The Mobius targeted and destroyed Junius 7, killing its one quarter billion inhabitants, including Lenore Zala, mother of Athens Zala. This event greatly radicalized 
Patrick Zala, and I'm sure influenced Atherin Zala in the course of Gundam Seed. The Bloody Valentine incident was the start of the war between Plant and Earth Alliance, and only got worse from there. What the Earth Alliance assumed would be a swift ending to the space colonies essentially turned into a battle that dragged out for nearly 11 months in a somewhat stand. This incident also led to the invention of the neutron jammer, which would change how nukes are used in battle. The battle will rage on for 11 months before the Battle of Heliopolis, which is where we meet our hero, Jesus Yamato. I mean, Kira Yamato. The Orb Union, a neutral country located in New Guinea, also controls the neutral colony Heliopolis. During the past 11 months, the Mobius was seen as inferior to Zaf's Jin units. The Earth Alliance needed something that could compete with the mobile suit. What they needed was a mobile suit that was able to be piloted by a natural. And where is the location of the development and production of these mobile suits? Heliopolis, of course. Not so neutral, it seems, Orb. This is why we get such a distraught Kigali in the first episode of Gundam Seed. Of course, Zaft sent a spy to find out that Orb was developing weapons for the Earth Alliance. A small group known as the Le Creuset team Le Creuset. was ran by the main villain of Gundam Seed, Rao Le Creuset. Rao is a clone of Al de Flaga, father of Mu La Flaga, and his original name was Rao La Flaga. But that information is left safe for a video that I will most likely never make. The Le Creuset team that infiltrates Heliopolis and attempts to steal the new G units consists of Athern Zala, Isaac, Diarka, Nicole, and, of course, Rusty. Zaf planted bombs as well as sent gens to distract the Earth Alliance forces, and it worked as Mula Flaga sortied to fight the distraction. During this time, the Le Creuset 5 infiltrated the colony. Isaac, Diarca, and Nicole take the first three found in the transport, while Atherin and Rusty go into the base to find the remaining two. He saves the girl, which turns out to be Kigali, but realizes he stumbled onto a military base where the remaining two mobile suits are stored. This is where he meets Murie Ramias, Ramias, who is a part of the Archangel crew. While the mobile suits were being stolen, the Archangel fell under heavy attack, killing most of its crew. One of the surviving members of the explosion was Ensign Nataru Bajiruru. Nataru Bajiruru. She was unfortunately the highest ranking survivor and thus assumed command of the Archangel during the assault by Zaf. Also, I never watched the dub, so I have no idea how to pronounce his name in English. Nataral Badgeriel? Mm, no. Back at the base hangar, Rusty is taken out by the Earth forces. Athern shoots Murie and goes in for the kill. It is during this time that he realizes that his childhood friend, Kira Yamato, is right in front of him, protecting a natural. We see flashbacks of Athern Zala and Kira Yamato as childhood friends. Athern even gives Kira his robot pet bird, Tori, or Birdie. Caught up in the moment, Murie shoots at Athern as he runs away. She then pushes Kira into the gun. As he is a coordinator, he is able to reprogram and calibrate the Gundam on the fly, something that naturals seem to struggle with. Taking control, Kira defeats the Jin with ease. He is pushed to his limit in his first battle as he saw some of his friends fleeing. During this time, Rao recognizes that one unit was not captured and it is vital that Strike gets into the hands of Zaft. He also joins the battle. Kira saves his friends and Murie, but Murie, waking up from being unconscious, naturally shoots at children. She forces Kira and his friends to remain by her side since they have seen too much in this battle. On the outside of Heliopolis, 
Bulaflaga and Raula Cruset engage in battle. They eventually make their way into the colony to find and destroy Strike. But before that could happen, the Archangel takes flight. Kira, now equipped with better artillery, accidentally shoots a hole into Heliopolis while trying to shoot down Raoul Le Creuset. The strike team eventually meets up with the Archangel. The Le Creuset team regroup back at their ship and sortie again with the exception of Atherin as he has been told not to. However, dying to know if it were truly Kira he was fighting, he disobeyed orders. He and the Le Creuset team go down to try to retrieve the strike unit, facing Kira head on. As the battle continues, Kira destroys Miguel's Jin unit, a member of the Le Creuset team. During this time, the Archangel takes down a Jin only to accidentally clip Heliopolis and the space colony starts falling apart. After confirming his childhood friend is now his enemy, Kira is flung into space as Heliopolis is destroyed. Kira's home is now gone, and he is also met with the reality that his former best friend is now fighting for Zaft. Like it or not, Kira is now a part of this war. Mu Laflaga, Ensign Badriel, and Captain Ramius discuss how to punish Kira for his actions of taking Lacus to the enemy without any direct orders. Ramius states that soldiers would be sentenced to death in situations like this. However, since he is a civilian, they let him off the hook for the most part. Izak tells Diarka and Nikol that once Lacus is delivered and in safe hands, they are to attack the Archangel before they meet up with the 8th Fleet. Izak most likely wants to not let Atherin know of that situation. He has Lacus with him anyway. The Archangel gets an alert that the enemy is nearby. Kira prepares to launch. While he launches, we see a more sociopathic side of Flay. The dual Blitz and Buster Gundam attack the strike. Moo's mobile armor assists, but his weapons are somewhat useless against the Gundams. The Blitz vanishes. Diarka in the Buster is being distracted by Moo Flaga, and Kira and Izak in the dual Gundam engage in battle. The Blitz gets in close to the Archangel and starts to attack. Kira is afraid of the Archangel being destroyed and goes into a rage. Izak takes a lot of damage. They decide to retreat. Mu Laflaga tells Kira that he was unbelievable in that battle. The 8th Fleet finally arrives. Back at Zaft, Atherin safely escorts Lacus to a transport vessel. They say their farewells for now. Ensign Badriel suggests they try to get Kira to stay as he is a valuable asset, but Ramius tells her they can't pressure him to join the military. Admiral Halberton meets with the Archangel crew. Chief Commander Koji notes that these supplies are mainly used in Earth's atmosphere. Meanwhile, Flay asks if she can enlist in the military. The rest of the civilian crew think it over and decide to enlist as well. Kira talks to a young refugee on the ship who gives him a flower. He begins to board a shuttle before the rest of the crew tell him that they are staying on board. Suddenly, Zaft comes into range of the 8th Fleet. The team leaves to go to their post. Kira doesn't know what to do. He looks at the flower that the little refugee girl gave him. He decides to stay on board. The 8th Fleet prepares for an attack while making their descent into Earth orbit. The newly enlisted soldiers take their position on the bridge. Meanwhile, Flay tries to emotionally manipulate Kira. The Raoul La Crusette team takes out four Earth Alliance ships with ease. The Admiral is witnessing the power of the Gundams. Remius asks to allow the Archangel to go into Earth orbit first and lead the La Crusette team away from the 8th Fleet. The Admiral allows it, as it seems that the Archangel is what the La Crusette team is after. The Strike and Mobius are on standby. While they plan their descent, Kira and Mu launch. Gravity is pulling their units down towards Earth. As the Admiral's ship makes its descent, they launch the shuttle with all of the refugees on board. 
The Zaft fleet continues attacking the Admiral's fleet while entering the atmosphere. One thing to note is that the Zaft fleet consists of two Nazca-class ships and two Laurasia-class frigates, with Frau's ship close by. Both the Zaf fleet and the Admiral's ship go down. Kira and the dual Gundam begin to fight. The Mobius returns to the Archangel, but the strike is preoccupied. Also, I really enjoyed the gel shield thingy that they put over the ship. It is a real upgrade to the plastic wrap of the RX-78 Gundam from the original series. While the Strike and the Dual Gundam battle, the refugee shuttle gets in their way. Isaac shoots down the civilian shuttle, thinking it is fleeing soldiers. Yes, that's right. That little girl that gave Kira the origami flower. She's dead now. Feel that sadness. It seems that the Archangel has landed in Zaf-controlled territory in the Sahara in Northern Africa. They intend to land in the Antarctica and are way off. The 8th Fleet is completely decimated and it is up to them to get back on track, but they now must do it alone. Kira is experiencing a fever, PTSD, and some form of gravity sickness all in one. It is very taxing on his body. Luckily, Filet is there to comfort him with sex. She comforts him with sex. Off in the distance, we see a mysterious group led by Kigali, the strange girl that Kira met in Heliopolis. We see a commander, Andrew Waltfield, enjoying a nice cup of coffee while planning an attack on the Archangel. Waltfield is an ace mobile suit pilot, but he earned his nickname Desert Tiger due to the fact that he was promoted by an advertising agency to raise the will and push Zaft propaganda. It seems Waltfield's Desert Tiger is a reference to German soldier Erwin Rommel's nickname, the Desert Fox. Back on board the Archangel, Mula Flaga is prepping a new mobile armor that they receive from the 8th. Neutron jammers are placed throughout the territory and they struggle to use their radars. Sound familiar? This is just like Universal Century for the most part. The alarms go off, the crew assembles, Missiles begin striking the area. The strike launches. Kira is struggling to get used to Earth's atmosphere. He is met with agile attack helicopters as well as Bakus. The TMFA-802 Baku takes on a bipedal mammal-like animal with caterpillar treads on its legs. This allows it to traverse the desert with ease, unlike Kira and the strike currently. Like most animals of this nature, the mobile suit focuses on forward movement, so strafing isn't its strong suit. It has a 450mm railgun, a 400mm missile pod, and a twin beam saber that comes out of its face. The Archangel gives Kira cover fire as he walks around like a drunken person in the desert, but he slowly starts to get the hang of it. Commander Waltfield is watching in the distance. Kira starts to get the upper hand on one of the Bakus. Waltfield notes that he is adapted very quickly. The Baku attacks the Archangel, but Kira returns with suppressing fire. The Archangel needs to get moving quickly. Mu Laflaga suggests going out in the new Sky Grasper. Ramius allows Mu to launch. The FX-550 Sky Grasper is an aerial support fighter. This fighter was actually designed to work with the Strike Gundam as the unit that mount the Strike Gundam's striker packs, which we seen last episode, and can help the Strike resupply. It has a 20mm machine gun, a medium caliber cannon, beam cannon, and an anti-ship missile. It launches and helps somewhat, but it isn't enough. Suddenly, an attack comes from the rear. The resistance group comes to aid the Earth Alliance. Kagali tells Kira to lure the Baku north of their current location into a trap. Kira and the resistance group work together. He lures them into position and Kagali sets off an explosion. Commander Waltfield retreats for now, but he has gathered plenty of data. The EA and the resistance meet at a rendezvous location. Ramius and Mu meet with the Resistance, which goes by the name Desert Dawn. 
This group seems to be well informed of the Archangel's current situation. They want to see the mobile suit pilot. Kagali recognizes him from Heliopolis. Kira takes a moment to realize who she is. Also, I want to note that now that Kira has enlisted in the military, he is an ensign. The same rank as Vajril. Nice. Izak and Diarka are currently in Gibraltar, a Zaft military facility in Iberia. Raoul Crusat wants the two to remain on Earth and search for the Archangel in an attempt to destroy it. Diarka is not happy to be staying on Earth, but Izak is dead set on destroying the Strike Gundam. Kigali questions how he is now with the Earth Alliance. Kira tells her it's complicated because she didn't watch our last Cosmic Era video. Kigali is also hiding a secret amongst her fellow resistance fighters. We will talk about this secret soon enough. Desert Dawn leader Sahib Ashman suggests that they go through Gibraltar to get to Antarctica or through the Pacific Ocean, but ultimately getting past Waltfield and the Lesseps is the hard part. Ashman tells the officers that the people of this area are ultimately forgotten and that both Zaft and the Earth Alliance constantly fight over territory that isn't theirs. Kigali goes to find Kira, but when she does, she finds that Flay told Sai that she was with Kira last night. Kira and Sai squabble. Kigali wasn't probably looking for this drama when she went to go find Kira. Suddenly, Commander Waltfield begins their attack once again. They attack Desert Dawn's village. Kira and the Archangel crew take defensive positions. The Resistance and EA crew run into villagers. No one was dead because Commander Waltfield warned the town before burning it down. Also, Mulaflaga essentially calls their village useless? C classic. The Desert Dawn team go out to attack. Kira launches in the strike. Oh, and uh, what is Flay doing during all of this? The resistance fighters are simply equipped with jeeps and some missile launchers. These people are savage. However, missile launchers aren't enough for the Baku. The Baku starts taking out resistance soldiers. Kigali jumps out of the jeep. However, the Baku attacks and takes out Ahmed, one of the kid resistance fighters. Gundam Seed really hates children. The strike comes in to assist Desert Dawn. Kira has figured out that he must use heat convection to take out units in the desert, whatever that means. Kira takes out some of the Bakus, but Watfield himself comes in in a third unit. Kira uses precision coordinator movements. He slows down one unit with his shield, damages another. Kira gets under the Baku and destroys it with his beam rifle. Watfield goes for the strike, but Kira uses his beam saber and takes out their treads. Waltfield retreats. Back at the rendezvous point, Kira continues a mobile suit tradition and slaps Kigali for being so reckless. Kira and Kigali are dropped off in a Zaft controlled town. They stop and get some donor kebab. While eating, the desert tiger himself, Andrew Watfield, disguised as Luffy, strikes up a conversation. While this is happening, a gang of Blue Cosmos terrorists attack the city. They all help in defending the city. Kira tries for a non-lethal attack, but Watfield kills them anyways. He reveals himself as Andrew Watfield and invites them to his home. Kargali takes a bath due to all the kebab sauces in her hair and... What's up? They changed it to a shower in the remastered edition. Okay, that makes sense. They probably wanted to tone down the sexy. Huh? They made it sexier? Why? Meanwhile, Kira and Watfield talk about coffee and space whales. While this is going down, Badriel and some crew members are pretending to be civilians to get their hands on some supplies. 
prices are high in this part of the world. Back at Watfields, he states that he knows that Kira is the mobile suit pilot that he fought from earlier, and that Kira is a coordinator. Watfield allows Kira and Kigali to leave for helping save his life earlier. On the Archangel, Sai tries to prove himself and fails miserably. I believe the purpose of this scene and parts of the scene with Watfield is to show that Kira truly is exceptionally talented. However, we are told that the strike is designed to be piloted for naturals, so I am not sure. The scene can't just be to show how much Sai sucks, right? That's just me. Back at the plant council, Siegel Klein and Patrick Zala discuss Operation Spit Break for the first time. We will get into this in a later episode. The council approve of the operation. Rao is informed of the situation. Meanwhile, Atherin and Lacus have a date night. Sai is currently in the brig for attempting to pilot the strike Gundam. Kigali is currently running a mobile suit simulation and is killing it. In Kira's headquarters, he is starting to realize that Flay might be a little sociopathic. Diarka and Izak meet up with Andrew Watfield. They are essentially put on the back burner as their units aren't equipped for the mission. This pisses off Izak. The Lesseps class goes out. The Desert Dawn and Archangel prepares for attack. Kira launches with the L Striker Pack. Striker Packs were designed to go with the Strike Gundam and the Sky Grasper. Each pack has a different use, but they all have an additional battery support that gives the Strike more time on the battlefield without resupplying. However, the Strike's phase shift armor must be powered down before changing packs, leaving it vulnerable to attack. Kira equips the Striker with the Ale Striker Pack. This pack was designed to enhance movement in zero gravity, but in this case, Kira intends on using it in gravity to float and jump high. Kira and Mu launch. Watfield and Aisha launches in the orange Lagao. The TMFA-803 Lagao is a Baku in many ways, but unlike the Baku, this mobile suit has short range and anti-mobile suit capabilities. It also is a two-seater, which is how Aisha is able to join in the battle. It also has claws. The Lesseps class ship is not alone. A Pichu class ship appears and corners the Archangel. Mu attempts to protect the ship. Kigali is frustrated with the Archangel crew. She hops on board and pilots the Sky Grasper too. The Lesseps class is a heavy cruiser mainly used to carry mobile suits. The Pichu class seems just like a tiny version of a Lesseps class ship. Not a lot of thought went into Zaf's Earth cruisers in the Cosmic Era. Kigali and Mu and the Grasshoppers take out the Petri class. The Archangel is able to turn around and get the upper hand on the Lesseps. Watfield calls for a retreat. He attacks the Strike. The Strike's energy is depleted. The phase shift armor powers down. Kira ejects the L Striker pack, grabs his knife, and attacks the Lagao, destroying the unit. Kira is sad that he had to kill Watfield. Or did he? The Archangel makes its way towards the Red Sea. Kigali is adamant about joining the Archangel on the journey. Mu questions who she really is. Meanwhile, this is the closest that a Gundam show has got to a beach episode. Kira and Kigali try to have a conversation, but Flay is too insecure to allow that to happen. Luckily, an attack on the Archangel begins. Dens are in the vicinity of the ship. The AMF-101 Din took note from a Jin tactical air unit, as well as some elements of the Sigu, which we see Rao La Cruce pilot in a few episodes. Its weapon set is similar to that of a Jin, but are designed for Earth atmosphere, unlike the Jin. They are over the ocean and Kira can't fly. Mula Flaga launches in the Sky Grasper 1. The Sky Grasper 2 is not ready for launch. The Strike peeks out of the launch ramp and tries to get a shot, but fails. Kira suggests diving in the water as some goons appear. He does so. The UMF-4A goon was an evolution of the Gen FEMW and is an aquatic mobile suit. 
The unit is able to fold its legs into its body for maximum hydrodynamics. It has a Mazer Cannon, which is a powerful sonic weapon, a torpedo launcher, and a dart launcher. Above the water, Mu and the Sky Grasper and the Archangel are able to handle the dens. Underwater, the strike goes in with his knife, but he gets his hands on the beam cannon and takes out the goon. Killing the goon reminds Kira of Watfield. Back at Zaft, Diark and Izak really want to join Carpenteria to fight the Archangel. Rao allows Izak, Diarka, Nikol, and Athern to go, but puts Athern in command. More goons are making their way towards the Archangel. The strike launches with the sword Striker Pack. This Striker Pack is designed for close range combat and it has a giant ass sword. It also has a rocket, anchor, and a beam boomerang. It can also be used underwater, which is how Kidda intends on using it. Atherin makes his way towards the action in a transport vessel. Kagali and Mu launch in the Sky Grasper. Both Sky Graspers launch anti-sub missiles towards the subs below. The Archangel decides to do a barrel roll, so their Gottfried cannon is in line with the goons in the water. Okay, stepping in during editing to note that the Archangel team is fighting goons, but the leader of the attack is piloting the Xeno. The UMF-5 Xeno is an amphibious mobile suit that focuses on short-range attacks, whereas the goon were more focused on long-range firepower. It has torpedo launchers, a close combat claw, and a phonon maser cannon. Anyways, let's watch it get destroyed. Everyone holds on for dear life as they are in Earth atmosphere and gravity and such. They are able to get a direct hit. Kagali gets sloppy and gets hit by an oncoming transport vessel carrying Atherin. Kagali goes down. Atherin launches his mobile suit in case the ship goes down, which it does. They both end up landing on an isolated island somewhere in the Red Sea. On the island, Kagali runs into Atherin. She doesn't hesitate and shoots him in the arm. Atherin makes his escape out of the valley. Kagali thinks he ran away, but he comes back and jumps on top of her. Kagali screams out thinking she is about to die. Atherin hesitates. He actually realizes that Kagali is a girl. One thing not mentioned is that there are constant references to Kagali being mistaken as a guy. She is supposed to be a tomboy, or at least an anime interpretation of a tomboy. Atherin doesn't end up killing her. Back at the Archangel, Kira launches to search for Kagali. At Carpenteria Base, the rest of the Lecurset team is informed that Atherin's carrier was shot down. Diarka and Isaac laugh at Atherin's expense. On the island, Atherin unties Kagali from her restraints after almost drowning herself. Atherin tells Kagali that his mother died on Junia 7 during the bloody Valentine incident. Kagali goes for Atherin's gun. They have a sexy standoff. Kagali throws the gun at Atherin and he is grazed with another bullet yet again. Kagali treats his wounds. The next morning, the strike comes and finds Kagali. Atherin and Kagali part ways. For now. Some time has passed. The Zala team, since Rao isn't involved anymore, attacks the Archangel. Kira and Mu Laflaga are doing their best to defend the ship. The Blitz, Aegis, and Dual Gundam are all riding on ghouls while Kira is on top of the Archangel. Since the Gundams can't fly in Earth's atmosphere, they fly on top of these things. Kira destroys Izak's ghoul. He falls into the water. Kira jumps and knocks Nikol off his ghoul as well. The Archangel is taking a lot of damage. Below them, a fleet appears. It is an orb fleet. Remember, the orb union is a neutral country. If the Archangel gets too close to orb, the orb fleet will engage in battle. However, Kagali suggests that they push through and she will handle talking to orb. Orb gives Zaft and Earth Alliance a warning. Kagali gets on the radar and informs Orb to get her father on the line, Uzumi Nada Atha, the leader of Orb. Orb Union attacks both forces. Zaft make their retreat. Orb eventually allows the Archangel to enter Orb territory. Back with the Zala team, Atherin calls Izak a bitch and develops a plan to sneak into Orb and find the Archangel. Meanwhile, Carpenteria will put pressure on Orb for harboring an enemy. Mu, Badril, and Ramius meet with the Ministry of Orb and Uzumi Nara Atha. He notes that it wasn't because of her daughter on board the Archangel, 
that they didn't attack. It is because he wants Archangel's cooperation in allowing them to collect data from the Strike Gundam and for Kira himself to work with Mogenrat. Now a few things to note here. Remember that the colony Heliopolis was also a part of the Orb territory. Also a part of Orb territory is Morganrat, an Orb state-owned company that manufactures weapons similar to Anaheim Electronics in the UC timeline. Morganrat also helps the Atlantic Federation manufacture all of the G project weapons, including the Strike. Orb wants the data from the Strike to help with their mass-produced Astray. The MBF M1 Astray is a mass-produced lightweight mobile suit that was designed with the L Striker packs as reference. Because of this, the Astray can fly around in Earth atmosphere in short bursts. It has a beam rifle, 75mm Vulcan guns, and a pair of beam sabers. We will be coming back to the Astray and its variants quite a bit. Ultimately, Ramius agrees and shares the data of the Strike. On the other side of the island, the Zala team sneaks into neutral territory. At Orb, the Archangel is getting fixed. Meanwhile, senior engineer of Morganrot, Erica Simmons, is going over the collected data from the strike and the data from Kisaka, who was the guy following Kigali around throughout the series. Once collected, Kigali and Erika show Kira the M1 Astray. We talked about this last video, but this is essentially Orb's mass-produced unit. Kigali tells Kira that the Orb Union wants to remain neutral and doesn't want to have any foreign nations invading them. Usually, in situations like this, other fighting nations will pressure the neutral nations or even force their hand to go to war. By having the production of mobile suits, this guarantees that they can defend themselves. Kigali is still mad at her dad for Orb helping the Earth Alliance, even though Uzumi didn't know anything about it. Erika shows off the Astray to Kira before telling him that she wants Kira to develop an operating system for the mass-produced mobile suit. Meanwhile, the Zala team is still trying to infiltrate the neutral colony. They receive fake badges and make their way towards Morganrat. At the Ministry of Orb, Uzumi looks at a file on Kira Yamato. He wonders about his past. The Archangel crew are able to meet with their parents while on leave. However, one family isn't with the rest. The Yamato family meets with Atha. It appears Uzumi Atha knows the Yamato family. Kira is working on the operating system. Flay wonders why he isn't visiting with his parents. Flay makes the situation about herself, of course. The team say their farewells to their parents with the exception of Kira. It is clear that he is ignoring his parents. It seems he is somewhat upset that he is a coordinator. Tori flies away. Kira chases Tori outside to find that the Zala team is right there with Tori. Kira and Atherin recognize each other but pretend that they don't as they both know what's about to happen in the near future. Atherin gives Kira his bird back and walks away. Colonel Kasaki informs Ramius that Carpenteria is most likely the most concerning enemy adjacent to their location. He also thanks the officers for helping to bring Kigali home. Meanwhile, the Zala team are patiently waiting for the Archangel to leave Orb territory. Because Kigali will not be joining the crew when they make their departure, Toll volunteered to be the pilot of the Sky Grasper 2, as he is second to Kigali in the simulator. Uzumi and Kigali have a talk. He thinks that Kigali's sense of heroism is selfish and that fighting with the Earth forces won't stop war. She decides to stay at Orb for now. Kira and Kigali say their goodbyes. Kira tells Kigali to apologize to his parents for him. They make their departure from Orb. The Orb fleet leaves the Archangel. As planned, the Zala team was waiting for them. Kira, of course, knew this too, so he was ready, waiting in the strike. The Aegis, Buster, Blitz, and Duel, all riding ghouls, begin their attack. The Archangel lays down a smoke screen. The strike is on top of the Archangel using the Launcher Striker. The Launcher Striker pack is a long-range weapon striker. 
It has a bombardment support control system and a 320mm hyper impulse cannon. Besides the second episode, I believe it is rare for the strike to use the launcher striker pack. Usually Mu Laflaga uses it with the Sky Grasper. Mu and Toll launch in the Sky Graspers. Kira begin using the launcher. The Zala team scatters. The strike begins fighting them 1v1 while the Archangel's Valiant Cannons give supporting fire. The launcher pack is depleted and the phase shift armor goes down as Kira ejects the striker pack. They prep the L striker pack that is attached to Mu's Sky Grasper. This is the first time we see a Sky Grasper transfer a new striker pack to the strike during mid battle. This is the striker pack's intended use longevity and firepower on the battlefield. Kira knocks the Blitz off its ghoul and takes it for himself. He destroys Atherin's ghoul as well. Toll currently has the Sword Striker Pack equipped and is ready to send it to Kira. Kira equips the Striker Pack. Atherin and Kira fight. The Strike has the upper hand, but Nikol comes in to help Atherin. Unfortunately, the Blitz Gundam only had one hand. Kira uses the sword and kills Nikol, destroying the Blitz. The Strike makes its retreat, as does the Zala team, but not before Atherin goes in shock for a moment. Back at the Archangel, Mu tells Kira that he is in war, and if he wants to win this war, he should stop hesitating. The Archangel is struggling to make contact with Alaska, which is their next destination. Back at the Vaz Gulav sub, Athrin mourns the loss of Nikol. He promises that he will kill Kira, but not for too long. As the team preps to attack the Archangel once again, the team launches on their ghouls. Kira and Mu launch and engage with the dual Aegis and Buster. Mu is equipped with the Launcher Striker Pack. The Aegis takes out one of the Archangel's cannons. Toll goes out in the Sky Grasper too. The duel and Aegis double team Kira. He is able to take out the duel's leg and the Aegis' ghoul. Kira and Atherin land on a nearby island and continue their battle. The Archangel crash lands on the island as well. Mu is able to take out the Buster's ghoul and arm. The Buster Gundam is failing. Diarca looks over at the Archangel and notices the cannons pointed right at him. There is nothing he could do but surrender. While the Strike and Aegis fight, Toll comes in to support with the Sky Grasper. Atherin throws his shield right at him, killing him instantly. Kida cries out in pain. Both have just lost a friend. The two are prepared to fight to the death. Both of their power is low. Their face shift armor turns off. Atherin turns the Aegis into its mobile armor form and grasps onto the Strike. He activates his self-destruct and bails. Kira is trapped in the strike when both the strike and Aegis explode. Both the strike and the Sky Grasper 2 have lost signal with the Archangel. The engineering team is trying to get the ship back up in order to take off very soon. Also, Diarca has been taken as a prisoner and the crew has taken the Buster Gundam back. Dins begin approaching the Archangel. Luckily, they are able to get the ship off the ground. The Sky Grasper 1 is not ready to launch. They continue to try to contact Alaska, but don't get a response. They decide to send a message to Orb instead. Back at the Vazgalov sub, Izak is the only remaining member of the Zala team. Atherin and Diarca are both MIA. Rao Le Curset orders the sub to return to base. An Orb Union team, including Kigali and Kisaka, go to investigate the island. They find the strike, but no pilot. Near the beach, however, Kigali finds a passed out Atherin. Orb takes the strike and Atherin. Kigali confronts Atherin and tells Kigali that he killed Kira. Atherin tells Kigali that they were friends when they were younger. Flay also finds out that Kira is MIA. Kigali gives Atherin back to Zaft. She gives him a necklace to protect him. Kira wakes up to find that he is in the presence of Lacus. The Archangel finally makes its way to Alaskan territory, but they are left on standby and can't leave the ship. At Alaska, 
a group of Earth Alliance members discuss the Cyclops system and the new GAT series of Gundams in the works. Back at Carpinteria Base, Zaft preps for a major assault. Rao visits Atherin and tells him that he is being promoted and will now be reporting directly to the National Defense Committee. Rao will no longer be his commanding officer. Also, Atherin will return home, where he will be the pilot of a new mobile suit that Zaft has been working on. Rao also tells him that his father, Patrick Zola, has been appointed Plant's Supreme Council Chairman. This position was previously held by Siegel Klein. Remember, Klein was a more moderate person in his beliefs, whereas Zala is more radical. This change in power definitely is a sign of more radical moves on Zaf's end. Back on Asprilius 1, Lacus takes care of Kira. Reverend Machio comes and tells Kira that he brought him to Asprilius 1. Now just a reminder, Kira was on Earth heading towards Alaska. Now the plants are all located over here. There's no way he got all the way to the plants while passed out. Anyways, I digress. Reverend Machio acts as a communicator between Zaft and the Earth Alliance, and not for or against either side. Machio has helped create non-aggression treaties between Zaft, EA, and Orb for the Junk Guild, which plays a big role in Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Astray. More on that later. Rao preps for Operation Spitbreak. Zaft plans on attacking the Alaskan base, but Rao's version of the operation might be a little different than the rest of Zaft's. Meaty goes to the med bay to find Diarca there. Meaty grabs a knife and decides to take out her frustration on Diarca. Flay finds a gun and pulls it out on Diarca as well. Flay loves a little crazy, so she jumps in. Miri sees Flay's psychopathy and realizes that she doesn't want to be anything like her. She decides to save Diarca's life at that moment. Look at these eyes, man. On Alaska, the officers of the Archangel meet with the EA. They essentially debrief the higher-ups on their journey. One of the men asking questions is Captain William Sutherland. During this meeting, it is clear that Sutherland is anti-coordinator and pro-Blue Cosmos. The meeting is adjourned. Sutherland tells Badriel, Mula Flaga, and Flay that they are being transferred. When asked why Flay, Sutherland notes that she joined the military after her father died and that she will be used as a propaganda icon for the Earth Alliance, and more likely, Blue Cosmos. As Atherin is now a part of Special Forces, he makes his leave from Carpenteria Base. He says his farewell with Isaac. Back at the Archangel, Flay and Badriel say their farewells to the captain as they make their way to their new post. Mu is mad that he is being transferred to California to be a pilot instructor. Remius is sad to see him go. The Archangel is to join the Alaska Defense Force 5th Escort Group. Patrick Zala gives the go for Operation Spitbrick. He tells Zaf forces that they will be attacking Joshua at Alaska instead of Panama. Both Zaft and Earth Alliance expected this giant operation to go down in Panama, but it looks like it is a direct attack on EA headquarters. Many of EA forces are stationed in Panama for this reason. Because of this, Alaskan forces aren't at 100%. The switch from Panama to Alaska also is something that Patrick Zala did behind the backs of the Supreme Council. Zaft enters the Earth atmosphere. The attack begins. Alarms go off. Mu runs off to figure out what is going on. Jins, Dins, Bakus, and Sigus all form on Joshua with insurmountable forces. Raul Cruset is in his Sigu. The ZGMF 515 Sigu was supposed to be a mass produced successor to the Jin, but because of the release of the G weapons, Zaft shifted focus. The Archangel prepares for attack without a mobile suit team. Meanwhile, Kira decides he can't sit around and do nothing while an attack takes place on Earth. The battle wages on. Rao lands at the Alaskan base. How so easy? Who knows? 
He runs into Mu and they battle with pistols. Rao runs away with Flay and takes her hostage. Mu finds a computer with information regarding the current mission taking place. Lacus gives Kita a Zaft uniform to wear. They sneak onto the base where they find the new Freedom Gundam. The ZGMF X-10A Freedom Gundam was reverse engineered from the G project by Orb and the Atlantic Federation. This Gundam has everything. Everything? Everything. We are talking Vulcans, beam sabers, rail guns, beam rifles, anti-beam shields. It has a multi-lock system, an end jammer canceller, has a phase shift armor, and a meteor unit that makes it even stronger, damn it! I know this is a Japanese anime, but this is the most American Gundam ever. I'm looking at you, Gundam Baxter from G Gundam. You are nothing. Nothing. Both the Freedom and Justice were created by Patrick Zola and the Plant Supreme Council. I guess since Lacus's dad isn't the chairman anymore, she decided it's time to do a little bit of war crimes. Kira takes off in the Freedom Gundam. The Archangel does its best to defend the base. Ralu Cruset looks at the battle from afar. He notes that the Eurasian fleets and the Archangel class ships are taking most of the attack currently. Mu finds a fighter jet and takes off as the base is infiltrated by Zaf soldiers. Meanwhile, some of the Atlantic Federation higher-ups are plotting something. The only response that the base is getting is to hold the line. No enforcement from Panama has shown up yet. Mu flies towards the Archangel. It takes a hit and crash lands on the ship. Mu tells Captain Remius that the Cyclops system is set up below Alaskan headquarters. It will blow once the defense line has been broken. The Panama forces simply won't be here in time, and everything in a 10 kilometer radius will be vaporized. Not only that, but specifically the Archangel ship, which since all mobile suits of the G project are now destroyed for the most part, has no role. Also, as mentioned earlier, Eurasian Federation ships are involved. It is clear this plot is done by the Atlantic Federation, and by extension, Blue Cosmos. Based on this information, Ramius decides to abandon the battlefield and retreat, as this is a lose-lose situation. Mu goes back out in the Sky Grasper. The main gate at the base is about to go down. The dual Gundam goes out to search for and destroy the Archangel. Izak takes out the Launcher Striker pack equipped to the Sky Grasper. The Archangel is getting attacked. Its balancer is off and they slowly descend. A handful of Dins suddenly come in and attack the ship. Mu is busy with the dual Gundam to help. A Din is about to destroy the Archangel ship until suddenly a mobile suit from above takes it out. It is Kira in the Freedom Gundam. Kira takes out an entire fleet. Captain Ramius tells Kira about the plan. Kira then opens a broadcast to both Zaft and Earth, telling them to flee the location before the base explodes. Kira immobilizes Izak as he keeps fighting him and doesn't retreat. Meanwhile, EA activates the Cyclops system. Everyone flees for their lives. Zaft looks on in dismay. Rao says that they've been had, but he lets out a big grin. Say, is he playing both sides? I think he's playing both sides. Atherin makes it back to Asperilius 1. He is informed that Operation Spitbreak is a failure and that Lacus Klein is now an enemy of the state for taking one of the new mobile suits. Atherin is in shock. Atherin goes to meet his father, who is now the Supreme Council Chairman. His father assigns Atherin to take out the Freedom Gundam using the new Justice Gundam. The reason this unit must not be in the hands of the enemy is because it is equipped with an end jammer canceller. Now remember, the neutron jammer disrupts radio waves, neutralizes radar, and messes with precision guided weapons. The neutron jammer canceller makes neutron fission possible, removing any radio disturbances. The Gundam acronym for the Justice and Freedom is Generation Unsubdued Nuclear Drive Assault Module. The creator of the end jammer canceller is Yuri Almafi, father of Nicole. While prepping the justice, Atherin apologizes to Yuri for what happened to Nicole. He definitely appears to be motivated by his son's death. Kira meets with the Archangel team. 
he tells the team that he is no longer fighting for Earth or Zaft. He also lets them know about the Enjammer Canceler. They debrief on the Cyclops system and how Zaft switched their attack from Panama to Alaska. Kira tells Ramius that Plant didn't know about this plan either. The Archangel crew are also unsure of what they should do. Because they left the battlefield, they would be considered deserters and would probably be executed for it. They wonder if they should take their chances with Ord. Sai tells Kira that Flay has been transferred off the ship. Meanwhile, one thing that Patrick Zala told Atherin is that all associates involved with the theft of the freedom must be killed. Atherin realizes that this means Lacus must die as well. He goes to look for her. He finds Pink Chan, which means Lacus must be nearby. He finds her in a theater singing. Lacus confirms to Atherin that Kira is still alive and that Atherin didn't end up killing his friend. Lacus asks Atherin, what is he fighting for? Atherin was followed by Zaft. They try to kill Lacus, but Atherin protects her. Some of Lacus's men come to save her. She leaves, making Atherin question everything about what he is fighting for. Atherin finally launches in the Justice Gundam. Like the Freedom, the ZGMF X09A Justice Gundam has more or less infinite power due to its nuclear reactor, phase shift armor, multi lock on system, and of course, an Injammer canceller. Exclusive to the Justice is the Fathom 00. With the help of the Fathom 00, the Justice can enter high mobility aerial tactic or high map mode for higher acceleration and mobility. This makes the Justice extremely fast. The Fathom 00 can also be used similar to the Ghoul. Atherin goes on the hunt for Kira. The Archangel makes its return to Orb. Uzumi tells the Archangel crew that the Atlantic Federation has been putting pressure and they will officially become enemies soon if they don't join and support the EA. Also a reminder, when the Cyclops system destroyed Joshua, it took out a good chunk of the Eurasian Federation with it. Now the Atlantic Federation is the majority of the EA and allows Blue Cosmos to sneak its way into the mix. The Atlantic Federation is now taking a hard stance on coordinators. Meanwhile, Rao and Zaft are on their way to Panama to take out the Panama Mass Driver. This will cripple Earth's gateway into space and leave them stuck on Earth. Rao invites his prisoner, Flay, to observe the upcoming battle. The attack begins. One of the pilots on the front line is Isaac and the duel. Pillboxes aren't enough to take out Zaf's forces. On the battlefield defending Panama is the Strike Dagger mobile suit from the 13th Autonomous Corps. The GAT-01 Strike Dagger is a mass-produced mobile suit that is based off the Strike Gundam. Unlike the Gundam, the Strike Dagger doesn't have phase shift armor and striker packs. It also has an OS that can be used by natural pilots. This was created by the Omni Enforcer, which is an arm of the Atlantic Federation and mainly composed of Blue Cosmos members. Zaft launches Gunners throughout Panama. These are giant EMPs. The machines go off and the power goes out. Zaft are able to destroy the mass driver and take out Panama forces. Back at Morganrot, Erika shows Kira they fixed up the strike and added a natural OS to the mobile suit. Mula Flaga wants to pilot the strike. He also acknowledges he is no longer an EA officer. The strike and freedom do a little training. The Earth Alliance Council consists of representatives of all the Alliance member nations. This must have been a really awkward meeting for the Eurasian Federation representative. During this meeting, we meet Murata Azriel, the president of Blue Cosmos. Azriel will go to any lengths to ensure the destruction of the coordinators. He wants to pressure Orb, but most likely he just wants to test his new mobile suits. They send a message to Orb telling them that if they don't assimilate with the EA, they will be considered helping Zaft and an enemy to the EA. 
Remius informs the crew that they are no longer under her command, and if they wish to leave, they can. However, everyone stays to support their captain. Everyone except Kazui. Midi tells Diarka that he is no longer a prisoner of war since they aren't enemies anymore. Atherin meets up with Reverend Machio, while Mu finally makes his moves on Remius. Azrael and the EA begin their attack far off the shores of the borders of Orb. The Archangel takes off. The Estrays also join the battle. They run into Strike Daggers. Kira in the Freedom and Moon the Strike launch. The new Earth pilots Orga, Clotho, and Shani launch in the new Gat Gundams. The GAT X252 Forbidden Gundam is piloted by Shani. It has a high speed assault form and uses the X200 frame like the Blitz Gundam. Its specialty weapon is the Geschmeidig Panzer, which is an energy deflection weapon. It also has a transphase armor, which is superior to the phase shift armor. The GAT X131 Calamity Gundam is piloted by Orga. It is designed using the X100 series frame and inherits the Buster Gundam's artillery attack concept. It doesn't have a mobile assault mode, so it rides on top of the Rider Gundam to go into battle. This is a long-range mobile suit and has a 337mm plasma Sabat bazooka, a long-range beam cannon, energy cannons, and an anti-beam shield. It also is equipped with the trans-phase armor. The GAT X370 Raider Gundam is piloted by Clotho. The Raider takes after the Aegis Gundam and also uses the X300 frame. Like the Aegis, the Raider has a mobile armor mode. It also uses the transphase armor and uses the Mjolnir Spherical Breaker as its melee weapon. The short ranged attack uses a mace on a wire and spins so it can block, beam, and shell weapons. Kira rains fire. Mu is still trying to get adjusted to the strike. The Calamity, Raider, and Forbidden begin their attack on Orb. Strike comes in with the Sword Striker. The Forbidden deflects Freedom's beam attacks. The Archangel is getting heavily attacked. Suddenly, Diarka in the Buster Gundam comes in and helps the Archangel escape. The three Gundams overwhelm the Freedom, but Atherin in the Justice comes in to save Kira. If you are watching the remastered edition, there is a brief moment where you see Shin Asuka and his family retcon into this scene. Shin will play a much bigger role in Destiny. Raider Gundam comes in and attacks Justice. Orgo, Clotho, and Shani are all fighting chaotically and getting in each other's way. Freedom and Justice double team Calamity Gundam. It also seems like the strike has the L, Sword, and Launcher Striker all equipped at once. I didn't know you could do that. Orga and Shani fight against themselves. Suddenly, they are impacted by some issue. They say they are out of time, and they retreat with the rest of EA forces. Atherin tells Kira that he has no intentions of fighting him or his men, even though that is what his orders are. He wants to have a conversation with Kira. Atherin and Kira meet face to face. Kigali comes in and gives them both a hug. Atherin apologizes for killing Toll, and Kira apologizes for killing Nicole. Back at Earth Forces, the three new Gundam pilots are all freaking out. This is because they are biological CPUs. These biological CPUs were conditioned, trained, and abused from a young age to produce a result for natural similar to that of a coordinator. However, they are unstable mentally and physically because of this. They must take Gamma Glyphepton if they ever have an episode. This drug provides dopamine and adrenaline, and if they don't take this drug, they end up dying. The EA technically treats the biological CPUs as products and not humans. There are doctors and scientists constantly monitoring them. After a dose of gamma glyphepton, they are ready for round two. Orb prepares for another attack. Uzumi and Kigali are frustrated that Earth Alliance won't even attempt to have talks and would rather attack. Kira goes back out in the freedom. If Earth truly does plan on destroying Orb, then this may be a tough battle for them to win. Calamity and Freedom begin fighting. 
Raider comes in. Atherin decides to join the battle and help Kira. Kagali wants to fight, but she needs to learn how to be a commander. Isaac and Rao are watching the battle from a Vazgulov sub. Rao tells Isaac that Flay may be the key. Raider and Forbidden return to the ship. Calamity follows suit after Freedom does some damage and their power drains from the mobile suit. Azrael notes that the biological CPUs are good enough to fight against coordinators. Since the EA retreats yet again, it gives Orb time to talk. Uzumi Atha gives the orders for Orb to retreat while the higher-ups stay behind and self-destruct the Kaguya, which is Orb's mass driver system and its armaments factory. The people have been evacuated, so the destruction won't leave a scar on their people. You know. Except Shen's family? Uzumi forces Kagali to get on her ship, the Kusanagi, and leave her father to defend the nation. She fights him. The Archangel takes off with the Buster and Strike to defend it. Justice and Freedom fight Calamity Raider and Forbidden as the Kusanagi preps for takeoff. Uzumi calms Kagali down by telling her that she will be with her brother. Uzumi gives Kagali a picture of her as a baby with a twin boy. That boy just so happens to be Kira. This was the secret that the Yamato family was trying to keep from Kira in our last episode. The Kusanagi takes off. The Justice and Freedom hitches a ride while defending the ship. They are able to successfully launch into space using the mass driver system. On orb, Uzumi self-destructs the base and the Kaguya. Kira watches as the once allied nation goes up in flames. Kagali cries out for her father. The Kusanagi is fully deployed and space ready. Kagali is still mourning the death of her father. Ramius and Mu get a tour of the Kusanagi, which is Orb's Izumo class ship. The Izumo class has a modular design and can be split into three parts, the front, center, and rear. Part B can be used for atmospheric re-entry and also be sent up into Orb using the mass driver. Well, it used to be able to. As both the Kusanagi and the Archangel were both built by Morganrot, the Archangel adapted many of the designs of the Izumo class. It also has a plasma blaster cannon, a Gottfried cannon like the Archangel, a multi-barrel CIWS and missile launcher. Its specialty weapon is the plasma booster which helps the ship get into orbit without the help of the mass driver system. However, as we saw last time, the Archangel used the plasma booster to get into space and the Kusanagi used the mass driver system. While on board the Kusanagi, Mu Laflaga wonders if Atherin knows what he is throwing away by fighting with them. Atherin chooses to fight with them, however. He also tells them that they once found people hiding in an abandoned Mendel colony around the L4 point and that they should head there and use the colony to gain supplies. In the plants, Patrick Zala tells the world that Lacus Klein is a traitor. Wait a minute, is that Shin as a cadet? Did his parents die like yesterday? Anyways, Siegel Klein is assassinated by Patrick Zala. While Klein is broadcasting a message to his people, Lacus Klein is also sending her own message of peace. Lacus Klein is informed that the Battle of Victoria is going in favor of the EA and their new Strike Dagger mobile suit. She is also informed that her father was just assassinated. Meanwhile, Azrael believes that the two units he saw at Orb are nuclear powered. Back on the Archangel, Kagali tells Kira that they are twins. She doesn't really understand the how or the why though, and neither does Kira. But he suggests to remember that no matter what, Uzumi is her true father. Back on Earth, the EA is building a ship very similar to the Archangel. It seems that Lieutenant Badriel will be assigned to this new ship. Atherin asks for a shuttle to return to plant. He wants to talk to his father and see if he could stop all of this with words. Atherin takes a shuttle instead of justice, just in case something happens. 
Ralu Crisette also learns of the Justice and Freedom Gundams in Jammer Cancelers. He is very intrigued. Kira tells Athern not to die and they part ways. Athern makes his way towards Yahin Dwe. Yahin Dwe is a Zaft military fortress and their last line of defense. Its thick rock walls prevent the fortress from bombardment and would take a giant nuclear blast to penetrate it. This is one of the two asteroids converted by Zaft, the other being Boaz, which we will talk more about later. At the fortress, Atherin meets with his father. He came in cuffs because he was riding in a Federation shuttle. He asks Patrick what his true feelings are about this war. Atherin's father tells him that he will continue fighting until every last natural is exterminated. It is here that Atherin realizes that his father isn't fighting for the betterment of the coordinators and the plants. He is simply the antithesis to Blue Cosmos, another force of hate. Patrick points a gun at Atherin and demands to know where the freedom and justice are. Atherin runs at his father. He shoots him in the shoulder and arrests him. While being dragged away, he tries to bust out. One of the Zaf soldiers helps him. He is Martin DaCosta a former soldier for Andrew Watfield, who says he is a part of the Klein faction. Over at the hangar, a group of Zaf soldiers steal a battleship. The commander of the rogue Zaft crew is none other than Andrew Watfield himself. It seems that Kira did not kill him. Watfield and Lacus work together to command the Eternal. The FFMHY-101 Eternal is a one-of-a-kind ship created by Zaft. This ship is specifically designed to house the Justice and Freedom along with their Meteor units. It is faster than the Nazca class ship and is one of the lightest in terms of firepower with only a large beam cannon, twin railguns, Vulcans, and battery defense missile launchers. Atherin is surprised to see Lacus on board. Yahin's mobile suit forces follow the Eternal. While the Eternal is getting assaulted, the Freedom comes in to help out. Kira is able to ward off most of Zaf's forces. The Eternal heads to the abandoned colony Mendel. Kira finds out that Watfield is still alive. Lacus consoles Nikita after the death of her father finally gets to her. The recently promoted Captain Badriel is running a simulation with her crew on the new ship, the Dominion. The Dominion is the second Archangel class ship that was created. The Dominion Corps is a part of the seventh space fleet. Badriel meets with Azrael for the first time. The Dominion will be the new home for the Calamity, Raider, and Forbidden. Their new mission is to also destroy the Archangel. Rao makes his plan to attack the Mendel colony. Meanwhile, Earth forces move most of their forces to the moon after the Battle of Victoria. The Dominion notices Nazca class ships and head towards the Mendel colony as well. We are starting to see the formation of the Three Ships Alliance. The Three Ships represents each nation that has played a part in this war. The Archangel represents the Defected Earth Alliance, the Kusanagi, which represents the Ideals of Orb, and the Eternal, which represents the Klein faction of the Zaft Ideal. Both Uzumi Atha and Siegel Klein both had similar beliefs in that coordinators and naturals could live together in peace. However, with the rise of Patrick Zala and Zaft and Blue Cosmos in the Earth Alliance led to a more radical shift. The Freedom and Justice are now on the Eternal while the Buster and Strike remain on the Archangel. The three ships notice the new ship approaching. It is the Dominion. They fire the large cannon on the Mendel. The Archangel goes out while the Eternal and Kusanagi prep for launch. The Archangel notices that it is the same class ship. Badriel suggests that Ramius surrenders. Of course, Ramius declines. Calamity, Forbidden, and Raider launch. Kira, Mu, Diarka, and Atherin launch as well and engage in battle. The Kusanagi is trapped on a cable, and a stray unit goes out to remove it. The Dominion gets the upper hand on the Archangel. All those moments of Badriel micromanaging Ramius may have proven to be a good thing as Badriel seems to be the better strategist in this situation. She launches missiles at the Freedom Gundam. 
Kira is able to dodge most of the attack, but is getting surrounded by the Gat Gundams. Meanwhile, Raul the Crusette and Isaac launch and head towards the Mendel. The Buster and Strike go to stop Rao's forces from joining the battle. Isaac is surprised when he runs into Diarka. Mu and Rao engage in battle. Now that Kusanagi and the Eternal are on the battlefield, the Dominion retreats. It is clear that Azrael has no clue about military strategy. Kira and Atherin recognize that the EA Gundam pilots aren't naturals, but they aren't exactly coordinators either. Mu, Diarka, Rao, and Izak continue their battle. Everyone rests, but Kira, who goes out to look for Diarka and Mu. Diarka gets out of his Gundam and tries to have a talk with Izak. Rao does a good amount of damage to the strike, but Kira comes in and helps out. Kira takes down Rao's Sigu, but he ejects and runs away. Mu and Kira chase after him. While fighting with Rao, he tells Kira that he was born here on Mendel, a place where experiments were done on coordinators to create something called the Ultimate Coordinator. Rao shows Kira the same picture that Uzumi gave Kagali. Rao also shows a picture of Mu and his father. What exactly is going on and where did Mu and Kira come from? We will have to wait until next time. Rao Crusette informs Kira that he is the ultimate coordinator born of an artificial womb by the hands of Ulin Hibiki. In order to understand the ultimate coordinator, we must go back to CE-55 and the attack on Mendel. Ever since George Glenn became the first coordinator, there was a huge coordinator boom. The rise in coordinators led to the rise in anti-coordinator movements. This was the beginning of Blue Cosmos. To create a coordinator during those days, you still needed a mother which was most likely still a natural. Because of this, it led to a weird time where women were seen as vessels for coordinators. It wasn't until Ulin Hibiki created the ultimate coordinator, a human birthed from an artificial womb and free from the burdens of having to be born of a natural mother. Hibiki tested this on his own son who was named Kira Hibiki. Ulin and his wife, Via, also gave birth to Kigali, who was natural born. In May of CE-55, Blue Cosmos attacked the R&D facility on Mendel Colony and destroyed all the research and killed Ulin and Via Hibiki. Luckily, Kira and Kigali were able to survive due to his aunt, Karidad Yamato, so it seems the people that Kira thought were his parents were in fact his aunt and uncle. We also learn about Mu and Rao's past. Mu's father, Al de Flaga, was an arrogant man. Because the coordinators were still birthed by natural females, Mu ended up not inheriting any coordinator abilities. So Al forced Ulin Habiki to make a clone of himself so he will have someone who is genetically superior to pass on his inheritance. But in return, Habiki had his ultimate coordinator program fully funded. This clone happens to be Rao Le Crusette. Simply put, Rao hates humanity. While he believes that humanity will eventually wipe itself out, he is not satisfied with waiting for that to happen on its own and works towards ending humanity. Unlike Char in the original Mobile Suit Gundam who played both sides to accomplish a personal goal of destroying the Zabi family, Rao is playing both sides because he simply is a nihilist. Mu shoots Rao and his mask falls off. They look so similar to one another. The Dominion prepares to launch and attack the three ships once again. Atherin in Justice and the girls in the Estrays launch as well. The Dominion makes the first strike on the Archangel. The Eternal preps the Meteor unit. Freedom Strike and Buster come out of the Mendel colony. Rao returns to his ship and takes some pills. It seems these pills are related to him being a clone. He wants Flay to assist him with something. Justice and Freedom fight Calamity, Raider, and Forbidden. Flay gets in a capsule. Rao sends a message to the Archangel crew regarding his prisoner. He wants Flay to deliver a message to the EA. Rao and Izak launch along with 12 Jins. Flay's pod launches as well. The Eternal handles Zaft fleet while the Archangel handles the Dominion. Justice and Freedom try to hold their own against the Dominion's Gundams. Flay sends out an open communication. Everyone realizes that Flay is the prisoner. 
Badgerill tells Calamity Gundam to grab the pod. Kira goes after Flay's pod. Raider is able to knock off Freedom's head. Calamity grabs the pod. The Eternal and Kusanagi group up and beeline through the Nazca-class ships. Kira is being careless. Luckily, Atherin has his back. Justice and Buster have to pull Kira back to the ship before he gets too deep in enemy territory. Calamity takes Flay's pod back to the Dominion. One of the Nazca-class ships go down. Zaftri regroups. Izak is starting to question Rao's leadership. On the Dominion, Flay gives Azriel a disc that Rao gave her. It happens to contain all the information on the Justice, Freedom, and Enjammer cancelers. In the Med Bay, Mu tells Ramius about his father and Rao. Everyone seems to be suffering currently. Back on the moon, Azriel wants to use this information he attained on an all out nuclear attack. However, Earth is currently suffering from an energy crisis. He convinces EA anyways. The Dominion is being supplied with nukes as it prepares for an attack on Boaz. The Lunar Fleet begins their assault on Boaz. Calamity, Forbidden, and Raider launch from the Dominion. They are accompanied by a few Aghanim class ships. We never talked about the Aghanim class ship when we talked about the Omni Enforcers. It has a Gottfried beam cannon, large missile launchers, and anti-air guns. EA launches dozens of nuclear weapons using the updated Mobius and what they are calling the Peacemaker Force. The TSMA2 Mobius is the mass production version of the Mobius Zero that we saw Mu Laflaga pilot before acquiring the Sky Grasper. The Mobius was outperformed by Zaf's Jins and they essentially stopped production. But they are perfect for the Peacemaker Force. Each Mobius is equipped with a nuclear warhead and their objective is to simply launch nukes. They launch nukes and completely obliterate Boaz in a matter of moments. Badriel feels so much remorse for having to resort to nuclear weapons unlike Azriel. Patrick Zala prepares for an attack on Yakin Dwe and prepares Genesis. Now that the EA have resorted to nukes, it is only a matter of time until they use them on the plants. The three ships must move fast and all out nuclear war is upon them. Meanwhile, it took almost the whole series for Flay to actually feel something genuine in regards to war. Good for her, she got there. All forces begin to gather at Yakin Dwe, Zaf's final line of defense before reaching the plants. EA sends out the nukes. Freedom and Justice launch in the new Meteor units. The Meteor is not just a great song in this series, but also a mobile suit support system. If you thought Freedom was overpowered before, you haven't seen anything yet. The Meteor uses the same engine as the Gen High Maneuver type and is very fast. It has beam cannons, it has a beam sword, it also has an anti-ship missile launcher. When the Meteor is attached to the Justice or Freedom, it essentially has the power of a warship. It is ridiculous. Justice and Freedom come in as the nukes are about to hit the plants. Kira and Atherin use their multi-lock-on system along with the Meteor system and wipes out all the nukes. The three ships come onto the battlefield. Genesis is ready to launch. It stands for Gamma Emission by Nuclear Explosion Stimulate Inducing System. It is a huge gamma ray cannon that uses nuclear explosions to produce a massive burst of gamma radiation, which is reflected back by an external alignment mirror and focused by a second mirror on the cannon to create a laser beam. Patrick Zala fires Genesis. A good chunk of the 7th fleet, which the Dominion is a part of, was taken out. All mobile suits retreat for now. Genesis needs to replace its mirror after every use. They go out to prepare for another attack. The three ships do the math and find out that if Genesis is pointed directly at Earth, it would wipe out all life on the planet. Indeed, that is exactly what Patrick Zala is planning to do. Lacus gives Kira a ring and Atherin kisses Kigali before they head out for another attack. Mu also kisses Ramius. You gotta kiss the girl before the final battle. Meanwhile, Izak is having his own what am I fighting for moment. Everyone launches, including Kigali in the Strike Rouge. The MBF-02 Strike Rouge was built using spare parts of the Strike and is more or less a copy of it, including the use of its Striker Packs. The only difference is that the Strike Rouge uses AI and additional power that changes the phase shift armor color to red and pink. Rao goes out too. Patrick doesn't want him to mess this up. Rao asks Patrick, even if that includes killing Atherin? 
Patrick says, of course. Rao goes out in the Providence. The ZGMF X-13A Providence Gundam is the last of the Gundams created by Zaft. Like Freedom and Justice, it also has an in-jammer canceller. What makes Rao's Providence model special is the use of the Dragoon system. Dragoon stands for Disconnected Rapid Armament Group Overlook Operation Network. This allows a single mobile suit user to control multiple bits that can attack an enemy from all angles. This is essentially Universal Century's Psychomu system and funnels all in one package. It requires a skilled pilot to be able to control all of the bits. Providence has 11 bits. Patrick decides to attack Ptolemy's crater on the moon with the Genesis. He takes aim and fires. All lunar forces heading towards the battle is destroyed instantly. Azrael just wants to murder the coordinator's homeworld, while Badriel wants to destroy Genesis and win the war. Azrael's racism gets the best of him and he pulls a gun on Badriel. Azrael launches the Peacemaker Force once again. The Archangel approaches the Dominion. They both fire on each other. Justice and Freedom handle the nukes. Kigali is almost hit by Forbidden, but Isaac comes in and saves her. Isaac goes in and takes out the Forbidden Gundam. Rao and Mu meet on the battlefield again and begin the fight. Rao is having some real bad brother envy right now. Justice uses the Meteor's Beam Saber to take out the Calamity Gundam. The mobile suit goes after Genesis while the Archangel attacks the Dominion. Rao beats up the strike really bad. He retreats to the Archangel. Flay tries to warn the Archangel. Azrael tries to shoot Flay, but Badriel prevents it. She tells everyone to abandon ship and go to the Archangel. Badriel traps Azrael on the bridge. He shoots Badriel a few times before going over and firing the Longren beam cannon himself. The Archangel wasn't expecting an attack after most of the crew retreated. They can't defend themselves quickly enough. However, Mu comes in to save the day and is beaten down Strike Gundam. His shield doesn't hold and the strike is destroyed, but it managed to save the Archangel. Ramius cries out for Mu. <coughs> wait, wait, wait. This isn't what I remember from my childhood. Bring up that original cut. <coughs> yeah, that's the good stuff right there. Let's all just pretend Mu is dead for now. Ramius aims its own long win on the Dominion. The Dominion is destroyed, killing both Badril and Azrael. Rao in the Providence comes in to attack. Rao is able to destroy the Meteor's Beam Saber. Clotho is the last standing biological CPU in the Raider Gundam. He has gone too long without his Gamma Glyphepton pills and is going mad. Isaac is able to take out Raider Gundam. Providence is able to destroy Freedom's Meteor Pack. Providence fires at the Dominion's escape pod, killing Flay. This awakens Kira's Seed Factor. We haven't really talked about the Seed Factor. It stands for Superior Evolutionary Element Destined Factor. It is when an individual attains a heightened awareness of their surroundings and their reflexes are enhanced. This is very similar to the new types of Universal Century. Your eyes also seem to dilate like you are on mushrooms. Pretty cool. There are no Earth Forces, just the Three Ships Alliance. Zaft has essentially beaten EA, but Patrick still wants to fire the Genesis regardless, so much so that he murders a subordinate for questioning him. While Patrick prepares the Genesis, the man that he shot was still alive. He ends up shooting Patrick, right as Kigali and Atherin come to clear out Yakin. Yakin Dwe is set to self-destruct and fire Genesis at the same time. Atherin goes into the Genesis and does a Star Wars. He plans on self-destructing the Justice to destroy the Genesis weapon. Kigali follows Atherin to prevent him from killing himself. Kira uses his beam saber and strikes the Providence, killing Rao, but not before having to listen to Rao go on about his nihilism. Yakin Dwe explodes. Genesis is about to go off, but the Justice self-destructs and destroys the weapon. But Atherin is safe and Kigali's strike rouge. Kira floats out into space with the freedom nearly destroyed. He takes it all in. Atherin and Kigali come to save him. After the war, Injammer cancelers were placed throughout Earth so that power plants can be up and running again, fixing the Earth power crisis. At Zaft, 
Isaac is promoted to commander after initially being sentenced to death for crimes against humanity at the Battle of Orb. Diarca and Atherin were considered deserters by Zaft. Atherin was officially discharged while Diarca was demoted one rank. The Nairobi Peace Conference led to the Junius Treaty, which officially ends the First Alliance Plant War. The Junius Treaty specifically outlines several points. All national boundaries on Earth had to be restored to the status quo. Thus, both the Orb Union and the United States of South America, which were seized by the Alliance, became independent nations again. Also, Zaft had to leave the areas they conquered during the war. However, they were allowed to operate the Gibraltar and the Carpinteria base on Earth. Neither side would pay reparations. Instead of an international tribunal, each side would try its own war criminals. Preferential tariffs for former plant sponsors. Nuclear technologies such as neutron jammers and neutron jammer cancelers are prohibited from military use. Mirage colloid technology is prohibited from military use. Mirage colloid was a gas that was used in Blitz's stealth technology as well as Forbidden's Geschmeidig Panzer. The moon is considered neutral territory, with both sides having the same number of bases. Foreign Minister Lindemann of the Kingdom of Scandinavia proposed in the Lindemann plan that strict limits be placed on the number of ships, mobile suits, and mobile armors that could be owned by either nation. The armament limits imposed on each nation by the Lindemann plan are proportional to national resources such as population and economic output, thus placing the plants at a substantial military disadvantage. One group was allowed to live on, however. Blue Cosmos. Because the treaty never put anything in about removing Blue Cosmos, it essentially allows the racism to build up all over again, leading to the Second Alliance Plant War. But that will do it for this episode and for Cosmic Era 71. This series still works really well, even with all the melodrama nonsense. I can't say the same for the sequel. Perhaps I will come back and do a video on all the Christian symbolism running throughout this series. Also, so much could be said about Jesus Yamato, the chosen one with an immaculate birth. We will move forward to CE72 and CE73 as we continue our journey through Mobile Suit Gundam Seed <sighs> Destiny. Until next time, coordinators, remember, if your plan is to play both sides, make sure you have the crazy racist under control. Peace.